Hello, everyone. Welcome to the call. We're going to just wait another minute or so to let people come in from, you know, previous calls and um, quick breaks. So we'll just, just give us a, a minute or so yet. I see some of the connecting to audio is taking a while for some folks. Still see some folks having some okay I think we're going to go ahead and get started and hopefully some others will join us as we um, go through our session today this is Nada Shoemaker with Voices for Healthy Kids I welcome you to our last our part four of the fourth four uh, part series for our IEE and coalition webinars. Uh, we've had some great sessions so far and I'm really looking forward to today's session as well. Um, before we get started though, I would like to introduce our facilitator for today's session. Susan Marin is the Director of Operations for the consulting firm My Power People, founded in 2018 to help clients advance their mission through policy advocacy and community engagement. Prior to joining My Power People, Susan was an associate with the New England Division of MNR Strategic Services. She has an extensive operations and business management experience and has dedicated much of her career to working in the nonprofit arena, collaborating on strategic action planning, research, community organiz organizing and engagement, and grassroots mobilization and training. Susan lives in Lexington, Massachusetts with her family and is an active member in her community, volunteering for Meals on Wheels and Cradles to Crayons. Susan also founded the Build Our Kids Success or BOKS box exercise program at the local elementary school. Susan holds a Bachelor's of Arts degree in psychology from Loyola University in Maryland. Susan, take it away. Thank you, Nada. I'm thrilled to be here today with everybody, and it's hard to believe that this is our last one. Um, before we hear from our speakers, I just wanted to give a brief overview. Um, please remember to keep your lines muted and use the chat box function to submit your questions. Uh, we'll be monitoring the chat box throughout, and we will also have um, a Q&A at the end of all of the pre presentations. Um, today's webinar is being recorded, and we'll share the link and the speaker's presentations with you. And I just wanted to let you know that you will receive a quick survey upon completion of the webinar and we would really appreciate your feedback. So as soon as you get it, I promise it's not more than a few minutes. So please take the time and complete that for us. We would appreciate it. Um, so I wanted to um, introduce our first presenter. Today is Nancy Katz with the Alliance for a Healthier Generation. Nancy. Great, thank you, Susan. Let me get my screen shared here. Can you all see it? Yes. Looks okay, good. great. Perfect. Um, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for um, signing on. I'm excited to talk to you a little bit about the work that Alliance for Healthier Generation has been doing over the past five I guess, guess just about five years um, with uh, Voices for Healthy Kids, um, specifically the PE and PA, Physical Education, Physical Activity Coalition. So that's me. Um, I have been um, involved with the coalition uh, the in whole time that we've um, been funded through Voices for Healthy Kids and have been leading the coalition for about the last two years. Um, and my role at Healthier Generation is that I'm Senior Director of Content and Partnerships. 
Um, so today I'll tell you a little bit about the coalition, um, uh, some accomplishments and key takeaways, and then um, have included a few resources at the end from the coalition and also from Healthier Generation um, specifically. So we were so grateful to have this amazing cast of uh, characters on our coalition over the last uh, five years. Um, so we really are so grateful to all of the amazing organizations listed here who have served on the coalition and provided their amazing knowledge and expertise um, to our thinking about PE and PA policy um, at the state and local level. So, you know, some of the um, folks you'd expect to see here, Active School, Shape America. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, our um, Lakeshore Foundation and the National Consortium for Physical Education for Individuals with Disabilities um, and Nick Pad, the National Center on Health, Physical Activity and Disability. I'll talk a little bit more about those because that's one of the probably greatest, I think, contributions that the um, uh, that this group made in terms of um, of PE policy. Um, so going back to many years ago, the goals of the PEPA coalition were to assess relevant research and resources, um, pro provide voices for healthy kids with feedback on the policy lever and the policy bottom line, and to try to increase the effectiveness of um, policy campaigns in this area. Um, and one of the other goals um, which we did accomplish was to provide recommendations for how to incorporate the needs of all students, including students with disabilities, um, into state policies related to um, physical education. Um, and that I mentioned those organizations that really helped us to achieve that goal. Uh, when we started out with um, the the coalition and then you know each year thereafter as we um, sort of reassessed we really tried to look at a set of critical questions um, that we could you know gather information gather resources and sort of use this to inform the field and inform voices for healthy kids um, so of course you know looking at which states have existing pe policies and how um, can we apply lessons learned from the enactment of those policies to other adv advocacy campaigns? Thinking about funding sources for phys physical education and physical activity. Um, physical education is, a, is definitely a challenging one in terms of funding, and that continues to be um, an issue. Some of you may have seen the um, RWGF report that just came out about childhood obesity, the state of, um, the state of obesity, and one of their two um, recommendations, takeaways related to PE was around funding and making sure that there are funding mechanisms in place. Um, looked at what types of training tools, communication materials, and resources existed or were needed um, in the field. Um, and uh, thinking about, are these um, policies being implemented in general and in a way specifically that advances health equity. Um, we were always thinking about how to update the coalition members if there was any uh, expertise missing that we felt um, you know, we could add to the coalition. Um, we also did, towards the end, start to have some conversations about sort of the intersection between PE, PE and social emotional learning and health, which is of course, oh, been a huge topic for the last several years, but of course has really exploded, um, I think, in terms of the, the COVID pandemic situation and the concern about kids and how they're doing in terms of mental and social emotional health. Um, so over the years, we've had lots of interesting conversations about all of those things. Um, so um, in terms of our accomplishments, I mentioned that we added um, organizations representing people with disabilities to, coalition, to the coalition, and we successfully expanded the PE policy lever to require that there be language around um, inclusive physical education and physical activity. So unfortunately, um, there are many cases where kids who have various kinds of disabilities are not included in physical education um, because of lack of training for staff or lack of appropriate equipment, um, not enough staff, um, a wide variety of reasons. And so um, we thought it was really critical that any state looking at passing a PE policy made sure that there was specific language requiring 
um, you know, that it be inclusive and that um, kids uh, be accommodated with the appropriate equipment or whatever else um, was needed. Um, you know, this was, uh, as you saw, a powerhouse uh, full of organizations, so um, was just a really great group to connect with, and um, we were able to really magnify efforts of all of the organizations through information sharing and social media outlet outreach. And then towards the end of our time, we really started digging in on this discussion of the difference between physical education and physical activity, and um, the policy lever for um, Voices for Healthy Kids as it currently stands is primarily focused on physical education. Um, knowing what we've learned, what was already known and what we've continued to learn over the past five years, which is that it's extremely difficult to pass PE policy at the state level. And often when it is passed, it is not fu well-funded or funded at all. Um, and that, you know, of course, What's the point of having a policy that isn't getting implemented? And the other thing that is important about that is it really is an equity issue because the schools that are going to be most likely to implement physical education are going to be the higher income, you know, schools that have a higher income base um, among their students and families in their um, in their neighborhood. So um, for all of these reasons, we really started thinking about do we want to sort of think about supporting PA policy? So not that we don't totally support PE, we want PE policy to be passed, we want all kids in the country to get an adequate amount of PE every week, um, but knowing that um, P the physical activity can be a little bit easier to, to get through because it's less expensive, it's a little more flexible. Um, so things like recess, physical activity in the classroom, physical activity before and after school, active transportation um, that you're gonna hear much more about from Arisa. Um, so we really were starting to think about this, um, this sort of separation and whether there might be um, potential for success in some places with just the PA part of it. And really thinking about that as not, you know, the end point, but that as the first step. And then advocates hopefully continuing to work towards PE policy, but at least in the interim, having the impact of increasing some, some physical activity among kids, which, um, you know, of course, um, those of us who are very, um, Supportive of physical education want again want to make sure that physical activity it's clear that physical activity is not the same as physical education. We do need physical education, but there's also just sort of we want kids to be moving more and what would sort of get us to that end um, maybe most most quickly. Um, so key takeaways from our time um, is that lack of physical education in schools continues to be an area of concern. Um, it's, it's unfortunately, like as I mentioned, a very hard sell and um, there, while I think most kids are exposed to some PE, very few have PE at the level that we would like them to have. Um, of course, the PE situation has been exacerbated by the COVID pandemic, um, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the work that Healthier Generation's been doing uh, around that. Um, but we know, obviously, if kids are learning virtually, then they may or may not have PE, although those of you who I talk to on a more regular basis may sometimes see my son running laps around the house. Um, today he was bothering me for weights, he needed weights. So he is getting still PE twice a week, which is great, um, but I know that is not the case. I mean, we, we are, I think, um, you know, from healthier generation perspective, seeing that a lot of kids are still getting PE, which is really exciting, um, but we know that a lot are not. Um, and then of course the physical activity piece, even more pronounced now that kids are home on Zoom all day in many cases in school. Um, so, and then thinking about even going back to school with social distancing guidelines, how is PE or physical activity gonna happen in the school environment um, as you know, folks are transitioning back into school buildings, but at, you know, with a lot of restrictions around you know, uh, space. So um, we've been doing a lot of work at Healthier Generation around that. Um, so I think, um, you know, we find that families, parents, 
the community is very supportive of physical education, but again, among the folks that sort of make the decisions, make have the money to allocate, it's a little harder to um, to sell that. Um, I mentioned that even when passed, implementation of PE legislation is quite variable and it does present an equity issue. PE is expensive, you need teachers, you need equipment, you need space, you need time in school schedules. We know that you know concerns about kids succeeding and grades and standardized testing and all of that have contributed to um, a decrease in PE over the years and that you know doesn't seem to have waned at this point. Um, and so that continues to be um, an issue. Um, I talked a little bit about how it sometimes gener generally can be easier to garner support for physical activity um, and maybe it can be sort of a ground softener for physical education. Um, and then the other piece um, is that, you know, social, the social emotional aspects of physical education and physical activity are a way to gain buy-in in the current climate, knowing that you know, there is a social emotional health piece to physical to um, physical education. It's always interesting working with PE teachers because they kind of laugh a little bit because they're like, we've always been doing this. We just maybe didn't call it social emotional health. We just called it whatever it was, team building, character building, you know, um, learning to manage emotions, all of these different things are naturally a part of PE. And so I think in this climate where there is a lot of focus on the social emotional aspects, then those potentially can be a way to, you know, help gain some buy-in for the physical education. We would like to think that just the physical health aspects of the physical education would be enough because we know that healthy children are going to learn better and be more successful in life. Um, and I, I would also venture that you're not gonna have great social emotional health if you don't have great physical health. Um, so although we would all love to think that that should be enough and that everyone should care just about that, um, we always have to think about how to position um, our issue so that people are gonna buy in and believe in it. And so definitely um, that is one, you know, one way to, to gain some uh, support for it. Um, so through our coalition, we um, developed a couple of success stories. I have links in the slides, which I know you're gonna get. Um, we did a great success story on uh, an amazing school called Gateway Michael Elementary, which is a school for children with disabilities and special needs. And they are highly committed to making sure all kids are engaged in physical activity and physical education. And so, and we've worked with um, that school as Healthier Generation for a long time. Um, we've also um, done a, a case study around PE and sort of, you know, academic, the connection to academics. And we're just getting ready to do, to release um, as soon as Voices for Healthy Kids newsletter comes out, um, our last success story on connecting minds and bodies. And this is a question Q and A with one of our America's Healthiest Schools. So for those who are not aware, um, Alliance for a Healthier Generation gives out awards, a healthy school award every year, usually to between three and 400 schools. And so we then really work to highlight those schools and um, uh, you know, spread the word on all the great work that they're doing. So this is a school um, that we highlighted, which specifically is um, doing a lot of work around the social emotional health aspects of physical education and making sure that those are really well integrated. Um, we're also working on a PE advocacy tool with Shape America and Active Schools, and so that will be coming out hopefully in the next month or so. Um, and we're currently working on a physical activity in the classroom um, on demand. Uh, training and again, this is really focused on whether kids are in person, in some sort of hybrid model, in virtual model, specifically related to the COVID pandemic, how can we find ways to facilitate physical activity in all of those cases, um, which is very timely, uh, you know, another one of the, um, another part of the recommendations in the RWGF report were, was around basically making sure that kids are still physically active during COVID, again, no matter where they are, in a school building, out of a school building, um, sometimes in a school building. Um, 
So um, those are some of the real sort of PEPA policy specific things that we have been working on over the past couple of years. Um, I included a couple of links down at the bottom. Um, healthier generation, bigger picture works to ensure that the you know, places where kids spend their time support and promote good health. And so working with Voices for Healthy Kids has been one great avenue for us to achieve that through trying to promote state level policy around some of these areas. Um, and then we also develop lots of tools and resources for schools and districts to use in order to um, you know, make the environments healthier for kids. Um, so uh, one of sort of our, I would say flagship resources is our model local school wellness policy. Um, and we um, have had a model wellness policy for many years, but we recently did a major overhaul of the policy. And I would say the, you know, kind of relative to PEPA policy, there's very little, there's nothing about PE required in a local wellness policy. Um, the local wellness policy requirement um, is a district level requirement, and that comes from the United States Department of Agriculture. So it's very much tied into school meal programs. And so it primarily focuses on, you know, foods and um, some nutrition education and sort of general wellness activities. And there's a very small portion of that that's about promoting physical activity. So we have um, in our model policy greatly expanded the physical education and physical activity section of that policy. Um, again, this is not required by any entity, but as we work with schools across the country, we are encouraging districts to expand that section of their wellness policy and include a lot more around how they're going to make physical activity happen and including physical education in there as well. Um, and so that's, you know, an area where we see um, as healthier generation that we can continue to really make an impact in that PEPA space. Um, the other part of the model wellness policy that we are thinking about is really like that movement towards whole, Scott, whole child health. So again, that those local wellness policy requirements are very much connected to food services and school meals. And so we want to, we're trying to, you know, help districts move in a direction where their local wellness policies are encompassing sort of everything in the, in the whole school, whole child, whole community, whole school, whole community, whole child model, sorry. Um, and so we've provided language for that. Um, Obviously, over the last several months, we've had to do some major pivoting over to COVID reality. Um, and so I did include a few links to some of the things that we've been working on around COVID. Um, we are, um, we have always had a healthy school assessment um, and that is uh, modeled off of the school health index from the CDC. We also have a RISE assessment, which is a social emotional health assessment. But um, when COVID started, we pulled together what we call the Quick Start Health Assessment. And this is really focused on ensuring that, hope, helping to ensure that schools continue some health and wellness practices during this COVID time. Um, and so knowing that schools couldn't focus on everything, but we wanna make sure that something has still happened. We really think, we really thought about what are the most, what do we think are the most critical pieces around schools in terms of you know, staff and student physical and health and mental well-being, um, and how do we sort of pull those together into one assessment and create lots of tools and resources to support that. And so that is, you know, what we've been working on this year and some of those resources. I mentioned the PA in the classroom is an example of one of those things that we're working on. Um, we have a whole uh, part of our website devoted to COVID-19 and back to school resources. We've been working on lots of resources around nutrition around and meals, around physical activity, around family engagement, around social emotional health, a lot of work around staff wellness and staff well-being for teachers and other school staff, including school nutrition services staff. Um, so that has been a large focus of ours. And then um, we have worked along with a number of other organizations, some of whom may be on this call, with Kaiser um, to uh, create their planning for the next normal at school playbook, which is again really helping to guide districts in terms of what are the components that they really need to think about as school resumes and they want to ensure that their students are taken care of mentally, physically, and academically. Um, 
So we've been definitely very busy with, the, as everyone has, I'm sure, with the um, pivot over to um, sort of COVID. Um, so this is just to acknowledge that this work was funded in part by Voices for Healthy Kids, an initiative of AHA and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation with support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Again, we've you know, been extremely grateful over the past five years to be a recipient of this funding and have been involved with work around um, PE and PA, school meals, um, the Every Student Succeeds Act. And so we've really um, benefited so, so greatly from the support that we have received. And that is the end of my presentation. And I'm happy to take questions now or, uh, yeah, we'll do questions now, right? Susan. Thanks, Nancy. Yeah, we um, can pause for a moment and see if there's any questions. We haven't gotten any just yet. Um, we'll wait for one minute and then we will move on. And there's definitely uh, a chance at the end for questions to come in as well. Okay. Doesn't look like any. Nadal, you don't have any, right? No, I don't have any either. Okay. Thanks again, Nancy. So, um, uh, the next two presentations will be provided by Marisa Jones from Safe Routes. Um, she's going to speak on two topics, so I will hand this off to Marisa. You're on mute. You Thanks go. so much, Susan. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, and Nancy, thanks so much for your great presentation. I know. Our organization has really enjoyed being part of the PEPA coalition over the years and really proud of the work that you have led that coalition to achieve. Um, so as Susan said, I'm going to talk about two different topics today. So thanks for spending your afternoon with me. Um, the two that I'm going to talk about are our work, the state and local active transportation financing coalition and the new mobility and active transportation advocacy work group. Hmm. Um, and I'll introduce myself. I'm Marisa Jones, I use she, her pronouns. I'm the policy and partnerships director at the Safe Routes Partnership. And I live in Philadelphia, where I live a very multimodal lifestyle, riding my bike, pushing my daughter to school in the stroller, in the pre, in the before times, pre-pandemic, taking public transportation, using bike share, and sometimes even driving my own car. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Safe Routes Partnership, we are a national nonprofit organization. We're fully remote, even pre-pandemic, um, and we work to advance safe walking and rolling to and from schools and in everyday life, improving the health and well-being of people of all races, income levels and abilities, um, and building healthy, thriving communities for everyone. And we really got our start 15 years ago, um, working with schools in mind, but quickly realized that what's good for moving kids to and from school is good for moving people of all ages around their communities on foot and on bike. Um, to all kinds of important everyday destinations like grocery stores, schools, and parks. So, really want to thank um, Voices for Healthy Kids for its support of both of these work groups, the IEE New Mobility Work Group and our Issue Area Coalition, the Active Transportation Financing Coalition. I think similar to Nancy and the Alliance for a Healthier Generation, we feel so fortunate to have received this support from Voices for Healthy Kids and the American Heart Association and Robert Wood Johnson Foundation um, for the past many years um, that has really enabled us to um, build this movement together. And with that, I will um, start talking about the state and local active transportation financing coalition. So through its support of this work group, Voices for Healthy Kids has made a meaningful investment in supporting state, regional, and local advocates to increase funding for walking and biking. Um, really what we started to find is that um, traditionally bicycle and pedestrian advocates are great at speaking knowledgeably about like why we need safer streets and sidewalks. And as we became more successful as a field at like getting elected officials bought into this idea, the next logical question was like, okay, how are we gonna pay for it? 
Um, and we quickly realized that like there's a dearth of information and knowledge on how to pay for infrastructure for walking and biking. There's a lot out there on transit. There's a lot of ton out there on like roads and highways. And so this work group was formed to really answer those questions. Like how are we going to pay for these investments? Um, and we work to build the capacity of our membership and of the field um, because we realize that successful advocacy in this policy arena requires this understanding of public finance that's pretty complex and like often foreign to traditional public health advocates. Um, and so we, um, when we were originally exploring this idea, we did a lot of research. We definitely didn't want to like duplicate efforts and what we learned is that there's no other organization or initiative that's dedicated to advancing advocates um, and partners understanding of active transportation financing at the state and local level. Um, and we're really delighted that like the healthy kids, healthy weight movement benefits from the information that these work group members learn and share out with their networks. Um, and all of our collective work to explain these complex funding mechanisms in ways that are um, comprehensible for ordinary people. Um, because this is a highly technical and niche policy area, I'm just gonna give like a little primer on why we need state and local active transportation funding. And the main reason is really easy, we need money. Um, the American Society of Civil Engineers gives America's roads and surface transportation system a D. Um, we don't maintain our roads and our roads are in dangerous conditions. But at least when it comes to cars and motor vehicles, we have a strong network, even if, if it's in disrepair. In contrast, our network for safe walking and biking is entirely absent in many communities. And even in cities that do have some semblance of that, it's grossly inadequate. And so, to contextualize this work group's effort, we are working to find funding to radically improve our walking and biking landscape within a larger need for funding for traditional transportation activities as well. So it's both a challenge and an opportunity. Also, the way that we currently fund transportation in general is highly inequitable with conditions that are more dangerous and uncomfortable in low income neighborhoods, rural neighborhoods, and neighborhoods of color. Um, and we have federal money for safe, or not for, well, for active transportation, um, but there are lots of systemic barriers to accessing it and not all states use it for its intended purpose. Um, and we're working to change some of those systemic challenges in the upcoming reauthorization of the federal transportation bill, but generally, we like state and local money for walking and biking because it's a lot more flexible than federal funding. And there's just not enough federal funding. It's mostly paid for by the gas tax. It has not been indexed to inflation. I could go on and on. Okay, so we pulled together some awesome partners to think about these complex issues of like, how do we learn enough about public finance to answer these questions and how do we um, make it easy enough for advocates to be able to talk to their elected officials about. So we pulled together national, state, and local experts who have worked on campaigns to raise money for active transportation and safe routes to school to create a learning community and then share out the findings. Um, this work group has done a ton. We really have co-created the field of state and local active transportation funding. I'm going to just highlight five top areas of work this year. Um, so the first one is thinking about how we assess how equitable a particular funding mechanism is. Um, we often get asked, like, what sources of funding are more equitable than others? And we would love, we really set out with the goal to like create a rank order list of like this one is more equitable than this one. Um, but that's just not possible. Um, we really recognize that when we need to raise the revenue to pay for active transportation infrastructure and especially for people most in need, we're often also placing a burden 
on the people who are most in need. So whether we're raising money through a gas tax, a local sales tax, increased vehicle licensing or registration fees, no matter what the financing mechanism is, ultimately somebody pays. And so we really spent a lot of time thinking about like how do we match benefit and burden. And I want to highlight we, ha we were so fortunate to have AARP, Jana Lina, um, present on her research on how she thinks she and partners think through how equitable a particular financing mechanism is. And one of the things she really drove home is like you can't create a rank order list. Um, and typically these sources of funding are braided together to sort of like balance out the benefits and the risk. And so these are the four questions that help determine how equitable a particular financing mechanism is. Um, another highlight from this year um, is that every year we hear from our work group members about state and local ballot measures that increase funding for walking and biking. Um, and just like a really important takeaway is that overwhelmingly voters approve of increased transportation funding at the state and local level. And this varies from cycle to cycle and like whether it's a primary or a general election, but well over half, often up to 80% of transportation spending increases that go to the voters pass. So we thought that was just like an important takeaway. Like there is a vehicle for this that works people, and people are okay. So when it goes to the voters, that's often a good strategy. Um, Another highlight from this year was deepening our understanding of the need to form unusual alliances in order to increase impact. So as we have um, deepened our expertise in this field, we really started to see this trend that states and cities that had the most funding for walking and biking had achieved it as part of a transportation package rather than as a standalone campaign. We wanted to understand what that looks like in practice. And so what that really looks like is understanding when there is going to be like either a statewide or regional or citywide braiding together of various funding mechanisms to pay for a lot of different things within the transportation system. So like one transportation package that will fund transit and roads and bike ped and other things rather than a standalone bicycle and pedestrian campaign. Um, and one of the partners that we, well, I wouldn't call them a partner. They're a group that we see potential for partnering with on transportation packages is the American Road and Transportation Builders Association. And I had the opportunity to attend their conference and then report on state and local transportation funding, not active transportation funding, um, and report back to this group about kind of what the key takeaways were. And I'm sorry, many of you have probably heard me tell this story before, but there was one story, the, uh, the lobbyists in Illinois, they just passed the big statewide transportation bill that ended up garnering $25 million a year for walking and biking, which is the second highest amount of funding for walking and biking across the country, second only to California. And the lobbyist was telling the story of like, oh yeah, the bike ped people wanted a little piece of our, our transportation bill. So we gave them our chump change and everyone in the room is laughing and my jaw is just on the floor like, wait, $25 million is chump change. Like we need to partner with these folks. And there are also like lots of stories of like in Pennsylvania, the Keystone Coalition partnering with highway and road builders to get way more money than active transportation advocates could have gotten on our own. Um, <clears throat> and then another unusual alliance. So um, again, without getting into like too much like technical specificity, um, gas taxes we use to pay for a lot of things in our transportation network. Um, and chambers of commerce like might not be the top of our list when we're thinking about developing coalitions, but we really learned that there's a lot of strong support for gas taxes, gas tax increases, both federally and at the state level. Um, and so just really working with our work group to think through like, okay, who are the folks that like, are the top level lobbyists and how, where do we have overlapping goals and how can we collaborate? Okay, now, sorry, I'm also trying to keep track of time. Um, so I would say our signature accomplishment for the year um, is something that we're super proud of. 
we conducted a national scan of state funding for walking, biking, and safe routes to school. Over the years that we've been working in this space, we could never surface like how much money is every state spending on walking, biking, and safe routes to school. And this is something that, you know, there's interest in campaigns, but folks would ask like, oh, well, how much are states similar to me spending? How are they paying for it? And we knew a lot of like individual state information, but we didn't have the comprehensive data set that we now have as a result of this work group. And so we've worked with our work group members to figure out like, what are the questions that we need to ask? And then also importantly, like how do we compare between states? Because certainly like population wise, demographically, like the amount of infrastructure, existing infrastructure and maintenance needs, like states are so different. And so we really worked with our work group to figure out like, how do we compare once we, yeah, once we gather all the data? Um, so what did we look for? We collected the dollar amounts and funding sources for um, spending on walking and biking. And we included any dedicated active transportation funding passed or in place within the last two calendar years. Um, yeah. And then we also um, included funding for safe routes to school. We did that separately. And similarly looked at dollar amounts and funding sources within the last two years. Um, so we, our organization, has a deep and strong commitment to equity. We know that Voices for Healthy Kids does. Um, but we often get asked, like, how does this get put into practice in active transportation and safe routes to school funding? And so we wanted to assess that as well. Like, how many states prioritize high need communities and how do they do that? So we did this by researching publicly available information from each state Department of Transportation website. We reviewed all relevant like plans, budgets, talked to advocacy organizations in those states. And then we compiled our research and our answers and we reached out to our state DOT contacts and Safe Route to School and Bicycle and Pedestrian to verify. Um, and 88% of those state DOTs responded to verify our research. So some of our key findings, again, this is the first time that this, these data have been collected and so we can't compare, um, but this is a snapshot. And in the future, we'd love to continue this research. So one of the biggest surprises, frankly, was just how much money states are putting up for walking, biking, and safe routes to school. Um, the amount that they allocate is equal to 56% of federal tax dollars apportioned to states to the same state. Um, and sorry, I know not everyone on this group works in transportation. TAP is the Transportation Alternatives Program. That's the main source of federal funding for walking, biking, and safe routes to school. And so the fact that states were ponying up more than half of that total amount is a lot of money. Um, and then I know I was sort of talking about the, the importance of transportation packages earlier. And so this research also validated that trend that we had suspected which is that advocates can secure significantly more money for walking, biking, and safe routes to school as part of larger transportation packages than standalone efforts. Um, three states really um, stand out as pace setters for active transportation and safe routes to school, and those are California, Massachusetts, and Oregon. Um, and all of those states allocate over $3 per person for walking, biking, and have dedicated funds for both active transportation and safe routes to school. Um, and if $3 per person does not sound like a lot to you, which it did not sound like a lot to me, um, for a point of reference, the average state spending on highways is $558 per person. So $3 per person to be like, oh my God, this is a lot of money that helps states do really amazing stuff is really shocking when you look at how much states just like freely spend on, on, on highways. Um, oh, with, well, whatever. I was gonna talk about the amounts of money for those transportation packages, but we, that's very detailed. We don't need to get into that. Um, and so we're really delighted that um, in addition to like sharing this information in a really detailed way for Voices for Healthy Kids and talk through the implications for 
Voices for Healthy Kids Policy Bottom Lines, we also were able to include this in a report, um, our biannual state report cards on walking, biking, and active kids in communities. Um, so everyone can check out this situation in their state by visiting this state report card. Um, some of the other key findings from this, so specific to active transportation funding, 28 states have funding for walking and bicycling. And the amounts of annual funding vary very widely. So like in North Carolina, they have $25,000 a year um, to buy helmets for kids. Um, whereas in California, they have $149 million a year for a comprehensive active transportation program. So really wide range. Um, related to safe routes to school, there are nine states that have their own funding specifically for safe routes to school. And four of those states have codified it in law in addition to appropriated the funds. Um, and then there are five states that have small amounts of money but aren't necessarily comprehensive safe routes to school programs. Oh, and just to, I keep harping on these transportation packages, but like in Oregon, their transportation package from two years ago garnered so much money for walking and biking, including over $10 million annually for safe routes to school. And then starting in 2023, that number goes up to 16 million annually forever. Like no sunset, amazing. Um, in terms of equity and prioritizing high need communities, there are 11 states that do that. Um, and we cataloged all the different ways that they do that. But one of the main points, it, one of the main ways they do that is providing extra points in project prioritization scoring. Um, potential uses of this research, I know I shared that we excuse me, shared like a very Voices for Healthy Kids specific memo about like implications for policy bottom lines, but recognizing that this is a broader audience. Some of the key takeaways, again, I'll just mention like join forces um, and, and be part of, of transportation package advocacy. Um, we also think that including these data um, in the state report cards can serve as motivation for advocates and states who know um, this is the first time these have ever been included, obviously. And we had some states like, wait, you know, I'm from Michigan and my neighbors, like, how, how are they doing? And wanting to compare and really learn from how other states are doing this. Um, it's also really important now that we have specific examples of how states are paying for active transportation and safe routes to school, as well as how they're operationalizing their commitments to equity. And then with safe routes to school, um, the fact that there are only four states that have adequate funding for comprehensive safe routes to school, paired with the fact that the Centers for Disease Control has identified safe routes to school as one of only 14 interventions that is cost effective and has a positive health impact within five years, shows that we have a lot of opportunity and work to do um, for expanding investments in safe routes to school at the state level. Okay, that was the fourth highlight. The fifth highlight, shifting gears. So like everyone, um, the coronavirus pandemic upended even our work group's work. Um, this work group was really contending with equity issues like, okay, how are frontline and essential workers getting to work and how can walking and bicycling be part of that solution? Um, so this is all like once the pandemic hit, there was a lot of talk about like open streets and that became this buzzword. And this group was really focused on the equity concerns of open streets and really kind of talking through this as organizations, like what does this look like where you live? What are the conversations like? How do we do this in a way that's more just and inclusive. Um, we've also been talking a lot about wanting to understand the budget impacts of temporary installations and solutions like open streets, like the streets for dining, um, both to make sure that if we're doing things that, so sorry, I could go on and on about this. Most cities have seen increases in people bicycling and walking during the pandemic. And so we've been talking as a work group about like, how are we collecting the data to make the case for future advocacy? And certainly not wanting to be like opportunistic about 
trying to cop political wins when people are dying. But in light of the fact that walking and biking are a safe and healthy and socially distanced way for people to get around, like how are we supporting that during the pandemic? And how are we using this to build interest and momentum in more permanent solutions post pandemic, whatever that means. Um, and just in general, this group has been talking a lot about like, what actions can we take now and in the future to support more robust active transportation? Um, and then also how are either severe budget cuts that already exist or that are anticipated um, at the city and state level, like how do those affect our advocacy um, asks with regard to walking and biking? And then just in general, this group has been talking a lot about like how active transportation can be part of this a greener and more just recovery. Like how do we emerge from, like we don't wanna go back to normal. We want to come out on the other side of this stronger and more just than when we started. And that's it for active transportation financing. So happy to take any questions. I'm also gonna take a sip of water before launching into my next topic. We haven't seen any questions come in yet, Marisa. So when you're ready, you can jump into the next one, I think. <laughs> Hi, Marisa. This is Shannon. Um, so good to see you. We worked on Complete Streets in Louisville together for a long time. Um, so I'm sorry if you already answered this, and I have been back and forth between a couple of things, but I saw where you brought up Safe Routes to School and funding for that. Um, in Lexington, we um, had a project that, um, I know Scott Johnson, or Scott Thompson, I'm sorry, he is the Smart Growth America um, kind of liaison, and he is here in Lexington, and we just had this huge project um, that got passed for um, walking trails and biking trails here in downtown Lexington. And I saw that you were talking about awards that were given. I would love to know more about how to give the Lexington community an award, a Smart Growth America award for that project. Oh, nice to put a face to the name. I can't believe we I never know. had that. Like, like pre, we worked together pre-pandemic before um, we had so many Zoom calls. So nice to put a face to the name. I have to tell you, I don't know the answer to that, but I can put you in touch with somebody who might. Perfect. That would be great. Most of our work has been like rank, ranking the state. Yeah based on state level actions. Um, and it's all like policy and funding related. That's what our like state report cards are. Um, but I'm happy to um, put you in Perfect. touch with the person that would probably know the answer. So, uh, that. Speaking of that, do you do any community like state report cards? Or obviously not state report card, but like a community report card? We would love to do that. And that's something that we get asked about a lot. Um, one, I mean, there are just so many communities that it would be hard to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. So unfortunately, no, but we would love to. Okay. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I think that the award would be a bit, a, a, a way to highlight communities that are, you know, doing really great things. Um, and we're really close in Lexington, by the way, on Complete Streets policy here. So I, um, yes. Very exciting. Oh <laughs> You'd be That's so great. proud of me. I actually said that on a call not too long ago. I was like, Marissa would be so proud of us. And Claudia. Oh, oh my gosh. Um, such so a great I just, campaign. I wanted to you say hi. And, yeah. Introduce. Thank you for your presentation. Awesome. It's been great. Yeah, thanks. On to the next one, unless anyone has other questions. So this has been a much shorter term project. Um, our innovation, equity, and exploration work group on new mobility and the effect of e-scooters on community physical activity. Um, so like I think we're all in this together, you know, we have rounded out seven months now of stay at home orders and social distancing due to the pandemic. And the standard fixtures of, oh my goodness, I'm sorry, my timer from my other one. 
<sighs> the standard pictures of urban life kind of feel nostalgic. So thinking back to spring of 2019 and we had busy streets and sidewalks and cars and buses and the new yet ubiquitous brightly colored electric scooters zipping around streets and also cluttering sidewalks. Um, and back in 2019, pre-pandemic, we didn't know what e-scooters and particularly shared e-scooters portended for urban transportation. Um, and while we now have a clearer picture of the associated impacts on active transportation policy levers, um, really as a result of this work group, the pandemic um, has not only upended urban transportation, but also urban life. Um, and we know that the impacts of the pandemic on cities are really widespread, and I certainly do not want to pretend that the greatest impact is on shared e-scooters, but shared e-scooters have definitely fallen victim to the virus. Ridership is down, companies are burning cash and shedding staff, and consolidation is rampant. And at the same time, through discussions with our work group members, we have a reason to be optimistic that with some thoughtful planning and consideration, e-scooters can be part of the recovery um, from this public health disaster and help build a stronger landscape of human-scaled, equity-focused transportation in cities. And so the goal of this work group, it's, I, I have to share that, that that's where we are just because it's such a radically different world than when we started this work group and it was like just scooter universe everywhere and like what does this mean for active transportation because when we started this work group we really wanted to understand how shared e-scooters are creating new dangers new equity challenges access opportunities and financing approaches for active transportation and then use those learnings to infuse new technologies and their policy frameworks with health considerations from the start um, and one of the things that i will also say that our approach to this was always using e-scooters as a way to think about proactive public policy what we i mean what we don't want is that we are as public health advocates we're constantly chasing the next technology like the world and technology change faster than we can change public policy and so i wanted to think about like through thinking about the impact of e-scooters on active transportation how does that help us think broadly about tech technological changes and public health policy? Um, so really, one of the things I'm most excited about about this work group is that it gave a meaningful venue for engagement um, with Voices for Healthy Kids for organizations that had not previously been involved at all with the initiative. Um, because new mobility generally and shared e-scooters specifically have not traditionally been part of active transportation, there's not been an opportunity for a lot of these groups to hear about voices or work towards shared goals. So in addition to eight longtime organizational partners, we were so pleased to have brought nine new organizations into the voices orbit. Um, when we proposed this work group, we were really interested in understanding whether the e-scooter industry is a friend or a foe. Um, I think so often in public health, we have adversarial relationships with industry, thinking about like tobacco, big tobacco and sugar, sugary drink companies. But with scooters, it's not quite so cut and dried. We have shared goals, not all of them, but a lot of them, like a lot of important ones. Like we all want to get people out of cars. We want to improve human mobility. We want to promote more environmentally sustainable modes of travel. And we want to keep all road users safe in the process. And while we retain a healthy um, awareness of the allure of money for private industry, um, we were really in, um, we're cautiously optimistic about these companies' eagerness to deploy resources in support of shared goals. Um, so again, like taking a step back, and again, this is thinking back pre-pandemic. Um, but there are a lot of mixed messages about, there were, and there still are, a lot of mixed messages about shared e-scooters that impact people's perceptions. And so this was one of my favorite exercises, just putting into Google, like, scooters are, and it's like, diametric answers, dangerous and fun, the worst, 
cool. So I feel like generally there's not consensus on how people or even cities think or feel about shared e-scooters. Um, we asked some longtime partners of ours that are focused on active transportation equity to respond to a prompt um, in like an anonymous kind of word cloud way. And it was just scooters and dockless bikes are, then let people fill in. And we really see both the peril and the promise of shared e-scooters reflected in this word cloud. People are people and organizations are excited about the new constituency of advocates that scooters are bringing into the fold and others worry that they divert attention from existing goals um, so definitely no consensus and another thing just to show this like bifurcated feeling about shared e-scooters is this poll with again longtime active transportation equity partners um, there are really different opinions. Um, you know, half of the respondents thought that tech-backed dockless devices like scooters and dockless bikes are great, and half of them just weren't sure. Um, and so we recognize that for these active transportation advocates, um, without understanding like what potential impacts are and having good consensus as an active transportation field, there's an op there was an opportunity for this to be a really divisive wedge issue within our field of active transportation advocacy. And that was another reason we wanted to pull this group together was to identify like what are potential points of consensus and what are sticking points that might need to be worked through. We don't want this to be something that divides our or splinters our movement. Um, so to kick off our work group, we wanted and asked our members to think through the best and worst case scenarios about scooters. And our goal here was really to get members thinking about how public policy can influence the future of shared e-scooters. To achieve the best case scenario, we need aspirational goal-oriented public policy, but we also need guardrails and regulations in order to avoid the worst case scenarios. So I'm just gonna run through some of the things that folks were worried about and some of the things they were optimistic about. So people were, they, they kind of fell into two main groups. So one is that scooters do harm. Um, you know, I was, I was in Salt Lake City for a voices meeting last summer, I don't know, sometime before when we were allowed to travel um, and nearly got mowed over on an even very wide sidewalk by somebody riding a scooter on the sidewalk. And I, you know, I'm a able-bodied person. I was able to jump out of the way, but for people who are less able-bodied or carrying groceries, like this could be and has been a um, endangering situation. Um, there's also concerns that, they, that it could reduce physical activity that people who had been using active travel modes like walking and biking are now gonna switch to a more stationary mode. And then there was also concern that the benefits are, of scooters are lost. Um, that like cities and companies don't work together, it's like overly regulated and then scooters just go away. And then in terms of best case scenario, um, a lot that came out here was really about potential cooperation between scooters and other active transportation modes. So thinking about how bringing scooter riders and the scooter industry into the fold can help grow non-car mode share and um, advocacy for better infrastructure that ultimately results in all road users being safe. Um, it was also viewed as an opportunity to improve transportation equity. So um, in the transportation world, we know that we have historically made some really terrible, egregious, racially harmful um, policy and funding choices, and they have a, a, an equitable and harmful impact on low-income communities and people of color. Um, and they're also really expensive to fix. And so something like scooters that are like light and more cost effective could be deployed um, in a more equitable way. So lots of potential best case scenarios. Um, because of the focus of the Voices for Healthy Kids initiative on kids, um, and also knowing that if we were going to pursue a campaign that would even remotely touch on shared e-scooters, 
we would want to make sure that we are whatever we're advocating for doesn't harm older people, older adults, or people with disabilities. Um, and this was really like kind of thinking ahead, like, okay, what would a coalition look like? What would who would potential um, opponents be? And just wanting to make sure that we're not isolating people that so much of our advocacy is intended for because of the shared e-scooters. And so we held this tripartite discussion focused specifically on the needs of young people, older adults, and people with disabilities. Um, and so we had folks really share both their concerns and their opportunities. Um, and one of the key concerns was, again, like safety for people walking either on the sidewalk or all the clutter, um, just, um, you know, for people who use mobility devices and aren't able to move a scooter out of the way and obviously they have to ride in the road. Um, but then in terms of opportunities, it's this opportunity for more independent mobility, particularly for young people, but also for older adults or people with disabilities. So some of the takeaways with regard to young people and e-scooters, there's a lot of potential and excitement about young people um, using shared e-scooters as a source of independent mobility. Um, there are also a lot of, yeah, kids aren't allowed to use scooters, but they do anyway. Um, and a lot of this has to do, we think, and through discussions with this work group, that it's like, it's out of an overabundance of caution. And it's also, we don't have a lot of data on this and there, this gets negotiated um, through city regulatory processes. And um, we would love to know like, what do, what do the data tell us about like, are scooters actually more dangerous for young people? Like we let a 16 year old drive a 2000 pound car, totally fine, but a you know 20 pound e-scooter, they're not allowed. It's just a little, um, it's not, necessarily research back. So we'd love, we would love to have more kids, young people getting into active travel modes rather than cars. Um, and we also talked a lot about the importance and value of non-infrastructure, which is like education and encouragement in active transportation land. And um, a lot of the research on injuries with um, scooters happens on, it shows that people get hurt when they ride the scooter for the very first time. So we're talking about potentially the opportunity to include like uh, e-scooter education in safe routes to school, educational programming, um, especially in places that have funding that allows them to work with high school students. And then with, with regard to older adults and people with disabilities, which are not the same thing, and I'm not intending to conflate them, but a lot of the things that came out were relevant to both of these groups. Um, among advocates for both of these groups, the trend and the general feeling has been that e-scooters pretend a challenge to safe independent mobility. Um, it's also not clear to what extent older adults want to ride scooters, um, but in some cities, there's strong organized opposition to e-scooters among older adults. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, like the I, this challenge of sidewalk clutter that's increased by e-scooter usage presents a lot of barriers to accessing curb ramps and presents tripping hazards for people with mobility and vision impairments. And so overall, our approach to these discussions, once we really narrowed in on like, okay, what, what is it that we want to work toward? What is it that we want to avoid? And what are some of the important constituencies that we need to consider? Um, we really wanted to, we really talked with our work group about how can public policy be used as a tool for motivating and regulating the e-scooter industry to be part of the active transportation solution. And so these were the overarching questions that really guided our work. Um, how can public policy mitigate the harm and promote the positive impact of scooters as part of active transportation advocacy? How do scooters align with and conflict with existing active transportation advocacy? And how can we adapt policies to minimize the conflict and capitalize on the alignment? And so some of the key takeaways that we felt were like were really important to understand, like to guide how we might either tinker with existing public policies like the ones on this screen or propose something new altogether or related to physical access activity, safety, and funding. And so with regards to physical activity, 
we don't think that shared e-scooters are a significant source of moderate to physical to vigorous physical activity. Um, but we also think that that shouldn't exclude them altogether from being part of, oh gosh, all right, everyone, the active transportation advocacy conversation. I'm sorry. Here we go. Um, and some of the key points related to that potential are that um, e-scooters, particularly like in their novelty, is that they're drawing attention to the need for protected infrastructure for walking and biking. And it was interesting, like some of the folks who were on this work group who have been longtime bike ped advocates that were saying like, what the heck, we have been like hammering home this message in city hall for years that we need like protected bike lanes. And like, it's only when the scooters came out that all of a sudden, like it really piqued the interest of decision makers. So rather than being adversarial about it, it's like, okay, wait, like we've got to capitalize on this interest and do something about it. Um, also, the scooter companies collect a lot of data, which is both scary for privacy issues, but that's sort of been figured out. It's a whole other presentation. Um, but the data that's collected by those scooter companies can help planners and elected officials make informed choices um, about transportation system planning. Um, there's also been research that shows that scooters are a gateway vehicle. So once people, they first they appeal to people who have never traditionally been city or urban bike riders. But then once people get familiar with like, oh, riding a scooter in the street, we're seeing people transition to a more physically um, active mode like bicycling, either on bike share or their own personal bike. Um, we see a lot of potential for the increased audience for scooters to help build political will and political pressure um, to build protected infrastructure in cities. Um, and then generally, like research on what makes places attractive and inviting to walk suggests that human scale environments are places that are more likely to motivate people to walk and um, Scooters are human scale, and so even though the scooter rider might not be getting physical activity, it's promoting this um, overall landscape that's conducive to walking and might motivate others to walk. Um, and then generally, <clears throat> e-scooters support physical activity through safety and numbers, um, and that and normalizing active travel and contributing to overall car light lifestyles. Um, safety. So similar to physical activities, um, the safety of e-scooters is connected to the safety of the larger active transportation system. Um, we need more protected infrastructure for people biking and scootering. And this is both to keep them safe when they're riding in the street um, to avoid conflict with cars, but it's also because we need the scooter riders off the sidewalks because that's endangering people walking. Um, we also think that non-infrastructure Education in particular can improve e-scooter safety, and that's harkening back to that to the study that showed that most injuries occur to first-time scooter riders. So, how do we use non-infrastructure to teach people how to ride? Um, and then, generally, like so much advocacy in the active transportation space has been focused on supportive infrastructure for bicycling that separates people from cars, and we think that there's an opportunity for active transportation advocates and both scooter operators and riders to join for forces for policy advocacy. And then in terms of active transportation funding, um, we were really curious to figure out like, can, like scooters impose a cost on cities in terms of like, at the end of the day, if scooters are blocking ADA ramps, like the city needs to deploy staff to go move them. And just lots of questions about like who should be bearing these costs. And we were kind of curious, like, oh, can we make the scooter industry pay for any of this? And truly like the industry is so volatile. So we don't want to tie like our hopes for protected infrastructure to companies that like, I don't know, might not be here or, you know, some have already consolidated during the pandemic. Um, but there's also this opportunity through the regulatory and permitting process um, that cities can really think through the cost that scooters impose, as well as the benefits that they offer, and then adjust or um, like set up their permitting and, and fee structure accordingly. 
Um, and like, I feel like I sound like a broken record, but more than anything, we see this opportunity to align active transportation, public health advocates, scooter operators and scooter riders behind specific policies, bring our various tools to the table to increase funding at the local level for um, infrastructure to support walking, biking, and scooting. Um, and so some of our main recommendations, um, so I just mentioned that aligning on policy priorities, um, employing evidence-based non-infrastructure strategies um, to promote equitable access to and use of scooters. Um, cities should use the permitting process to set aspirational targets and goals with regard to safety and equity. Um, so that scooter companies are required to meet them if they want to be permitted to operate in those cities. And the thing that honestly I'm most excited about, and I think the thing that felt like, yes, we have coalesced around an idea and there's momentum behind this, is that, so we proposed this as a um, potential revision to the policy lever, but that didn't happen, but that's okay. But still share it, we're still excited about the idea. Um, and so the, the idea is to create accountability mechanisms for cities to implement bicycle and pedestrian plans. That was a policy that pretty much everyone on the work group was like, yeah, this would make a difference. We'll talk a little bit about that. And so I will just also put the pitch out there that if anybody is like a branding or marketing person and has a better name, succinct name for this policy idea, please share it. That's not my wheelhouse. Um, so we are, this group and our organization and partners of ours are really excited about bicycle and pedestrian plan implementation ordinances, also sometimes called bike plans with teeth, often referred to as Cambridge style ordinances because the first city in the country to pass this kind of policy was Cambridge, Massachusetts. But basically what it does is it is an ordinance that requires the implementation of a bicycle or pedestrian plan when road work is happening. And we propose this as a revision to the complete streets policy lever, not to replace it, just as another way of meeting that. And one of the things, and actually, Shannon, I was talking about this um, in Kentucky, about how, in, in Louisville, about how so much work was like getting public works on board. And I think one of the challenges Again, this is not to tear down complete streets policies. They're super important, but often some of the put some of the biggest pushback is from public works because it's not complete streets policies don't tell them this is the treatment you have to install on a particular road. It sort of like opens up the whole universe of a project. So like, okay, public works, think through everything that could possibly go on this road. And this type of ordinance aligns a pre-existing community. Um, plan that has had community input already and says like, oh, you're repaving Poplar Street. Well, Poplar Street is on our bicycle master plan to get a bike lane. So it aligns an existing community approved plan with um, a public works plan and it creates compliance provisions. And so really what this type of policy does is it limits the discretion of the city and of public works and just makes it much clearer that like, this is what you have to do. This is like you have to add this amount of sidewalk when you're touching this street. Um, and the cities that have passed this that are Seattle, Washington, Berkeley, California, and Cambridge, Massachusetts, they all have different like triggering language for when this has to be implemented. Um, but what we're really excited about is that this can help build true connected network for people walking and biking within reasonable amounts of time. And with that, I thank you so much for listening to me talk for a very long time about kind of very technically specific, specific um, policy areas. Um, but here's our website. And if you have any questions, happy to answer them now or via email at the email address listed here. Thank you, Marisa. Um, I don't think we've had any questions come in just yet. Um, we'll pause for a moment, see if anyone has any.
Nadal, I just want to confirm that nothing came in directly to you. Is that right? No, nothing came in to me. Okay. Well, as we're waiting just another minute, um, in case any questions come in, I just wanted to remind everybody that um, the survey will be coming to you. So if you could please just take a few minutes of your time and fill that out, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, and um, it looks like we still don't have any. So we'll give everybody some time back in their day. Um, as we close today, I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us um, and especially thank our speakers, Nancy and Marisa, your presentations were very thorough and, and uh, we appreciate all the hard work that went into them. Um, again, please be on the lookout for the survey and thanks again for joining us today. So have a great day. Great, thank you so much. Bye.